Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm very delighted to welcome you all today as the Executive Director of the Baltic German University Liaison Office to the international online discussion, The Narratives of Injustice in Legal Context, Baltic States in 1940 and Ukraine in 2022. I'm really pleased about the morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. To organize the right to work communication with Nicolas Romeris University and the Baltic Legal Historian Association, especially with our Associate Professor Dovila Sagatine. Thank you very much for this cooperation. And the great collaboration started with the project competition when the office supported Associate Professor Sagatine's managed project. So the Baltic German University Lesion Office aims to play an active role by initiating and strengthening scientific ties between Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Germany through our annual project competition, as well as to provide a platform for scholars and scientists to discuss topical issues of science. So we are very glad to host this international online discussion with four dedicated speakers from different countries who will give you exciting insights and perspectives into the topic on narratives of injustice. Today, 83 years ago, exactly on this day, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed, and tomorrow, on August 24th, is the day of Ukraine's independence in order to commemorate the country's declaration of independence from the USSR in 1991. So I believe that today's discussion is a very important one with a high relevance due to the war of aggression that Russia has been waging in Ukraine, not only since this year. And our speakers are going to reflect upon the Russian-Soviet legal narratives which were established during the 19th and 20th centuries in the Baltic states, but identify which of them has been reoccurring again during the 21st century. For now, I wish all of you a meaningful event and fruitful discussions. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I will give the word to our today's discussion moderator, Professor Samita Hosikov. Thank you, Mrs. Pranka. Thank you for this great event supported by Baltic Hochschule Kontor. It is possible today speak about narratives of injustice in legal context. In 1939, with the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, the legal basis was laid for a worldwide and bloody war, in which continental Europe suffered the most, but the Baltic states disappeared from the map at all. After the Second World War, the world, and especially Europe, did everything to continue to live in peace. We even agreed it on the principle that the winners are not punishable. The crimes of the Soviet state after World War II were neither punished nor even recognized. Stalin continued to rule with the firm hand. Only few scientists have studied the role and guilt of the Soviet state in the war crimes against the, against the civil population, dissidents, entire countries, etc. Most of them were Balts who went into exile after World War II. War crimes, genocide is a legal issue. Old war crimes are an area of study for legal, historia, legal historians. That is why today, Remembering the anniversary of the conclusion of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, we have uh, gathered for this online conference as a sign of solidarity with the Ukraine people. We study history in order not to repeat the mistakes we made, but we see uh, that history also allows us to identify today ris today's risks and predict the next steps of countries who still use historically approved tactics. For example, deporting uh, people to Siberia, uh, holding a referendum in the annexed lands to join the occupying country, 
we, the Baltic states, experienced all this more than 60 years ago. Never in my life I would like, never in my life I would have believed that a nation would have to experience this today. Most part of Europe still doesn't understand that this is actually happening because it is beyond their imagination. So it is our duty to share experiences, share knowledge, to defeat our common enemy. It's reason why today we speak from point of view legal history and point of view of uh, public international law, because these two points together make us stronger, more experienceful, and I'm very pleased uh, that our first speaker is Professor Dovila Sagatine, which is dean at the school, law school of uh, Mikolas Romeris. And I saw that uh, last year's publication from Dovila is about this topic. For many years, uh, Professor Sagatine researched this topic and will share their experience with you today and speak about the false narrative of Lithuania during the USSR in 1940 and its recovery in Ukraine context. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, so much, uh, dear professor. And uh, I am really glad to see you all here because I know uh, it is a, always a struggle to gather different scholars from different places to one to one point. So I am really pleased you are all here. And of course, I would love to um, uh, to thank uh, um, Mrs. Pranka. She support because um, uh, the foundation she is leading um, supported this event, and that's what, why this event is happening together uh, with the Nicholas Ramirez University and Balticos. Uh, and the Association of Baltic uh, Legal Historians. So this is actually the first event um, representing Baltic legal historians. I hope, uh, and not only them, so I hope that in the future we will be uh, more active in this uh, field and we will try to uh, recognize what is happening in today's world using the experience we had uh, before. So uh, let me um, start my uh, presentation. I have a few slides. Uh, these uh, slides are not so um, uh, lengthy, so um, just uh, I will ask the moderator to notify me uh, when there will be 15 minutes of my uh, presentation, uh, so uh, I will get not some notification. So uh, as it was mentioned before, my presentation is about the false narrative of Lithuania asking to join SSR in 1940s and its recovery in Ukrainian context. Of course, asking to join is in question marks, yes, and uh, now I will explain why it is in question marks, yes. So uh, I decided to start my presentation with the, uh, presenting the false narratives then and now, and the false narratives which are focusing or based on the right of nations uh, to, uh, to self-determination. We know that legal concept, yes, that legal concept is very widely known and it's, it's very popular and, and of course, this, is, uh, this concept is very important to small nations uh, like the Baltic uh, states and other small nations. So uh, what are those false narratives which are circulating uh, today and which were used uh, in 1940s? So let me start from today, because today we now we can relate more, yes? So uh, the narrative, the false narrative, which is uh, circulating for many years now in the, uh, our space, social space, uh, not only in the Baltics, but also in Germany, in all the Europe, so that the most of Ukraine will voluntarily become part of Russia. So this narrative you can see at least from 1914 or even earlier. And uh, of course, in 2022, uh, there were some new developments. So what, what is that false narrative about? Uh, the first point is that most Ukraine will sooner or later return to Russia and become a part uh, of it voluntarily. What does it mean, return? It means that, you know, Ukraine 
it's not a real country. It doesn't have independence of so or sovereignty. They just, you know, they just escaped for some time and now they will return. This is very important word in, in this narrative, return. Then maybe it will be the whole Ukraine. Again, this is also damaging the, uh, the, uh, the concept of the uh, sovereignty of Ukraine because they are claiming that the whole Ukraine is false, yes? The sooner that this happens, the better it will be for the Ukrainians. Can you see how the message is constructed? That this is, you know, a positive thing. It's not negative thing, it's a positive thing. So this is, of course, the part of propaganda of disinformation. But you know, uh, uh, in 2022, we had even uh, uh, bigger developments uh, that because uh, Donetsk and uh, Luhansk uh, People Repub People's Republics were, uh, were claimed to be independent states. Uh, as far as I know, no not many countries decided to um, how to say it, to adopt this uh, statement. And if, if you know, uh, I, I'm sure you heard that even Kazakhstan president said in recent conferences that no, we are not uh, uh, confirming uh, this, um, not approving this uh, claim that those republics are independent states. So this is a very complicated issue, but nevertheless, Pro Russia claimed that these are independent states. And uh, another development is the, uh, that, uh, of course, in question marks, liberated Ukrainian territories are joining Russia by referendums. So, of course, uh, we are talking about Zaporizhia region and Kherson region, region, and I will show you some maps later. So you will see that how big those territories are. And they are now on the occupation of Russia, but still referendums are on the way. And, uh, you know, you see that I um, uh, noted for you that maybe September 2022, uh, but we hope that it won't happen yet. It won't happen because uh, now, of course, uh, uh, there is a big struggle in, in that area, Crimea, and, and uh, you, you saw what's happening in Crimea recently. So let's hope that uh, it's not too late, but uh, still referendum is in the agenda. I mean, they are talking about referendums. They are talking to use legal instruments to do illegal things like, you know, annexation of, of foreign territories. So this is nothing new for us. For Baltic states, it's almost nothing new for us, yes. So what happened uh, in Lithuania, in Latvia and Estonia, uh, I will explain later, but what is the narrative, the false narrative, which is circulating again in the audiences, uh, not only in our in the, our Baltic states, but also in the Western audiences. This message is also delivered to Western audiences to explain what happened in the Baltics, yes? So we also need to tell our story. So the false narrative about the 1940s in Baltic states is that these states asked to be incorporated into the uh, Soviet Union. So what are the claims, the main points of that claim? The Soviet leadership did not initially want to incorporate the Baltic states, but had to do that because of uh, our Nazi, uh, of uh, the collaboration with the Nazi Germany, yes? In the summer of 1940s, Lithuania and remaining two uh, Baltic states became part of the Soviet Union. The same year, the Lithuanian government issued a declaration formally asking for the, for the Republic to be accepted to the Soviet Union. So I will talk about that declaration later, but this is the false narrative which is presented. Uh, and similar documents were then submitted by Latvia and Estonia and became legal grounds for this inclusion. So anyone in the Baltic states will tell you that this is false. Of course, there are some people that don't know that story uh, or choose not to, uh, not to, um, uh, how to say, not to um, uh, uh, trust facts, but to trust some uh, false narratives. But still, this message is also transmitted to the, uh, to the Western audience and still Till today, I mean, this is also happening today. This false narratives about 1940s is still here. This is still here, and you can see how they can uh, how they can be related to the, what's happening in Ukraine right now. So, of course, uh, the reason of uh, those false narratives uh, coming to life 
uh, in the 1940s, it was the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, uh, of, uh, uh, which was um, signed uh, 83 years uh, ago on this day. So you can see here the, the famous photo of, um, uh, of that uh, pack, signing pact. Of course, there were no photos of secret protocol signing. This is only the official part. And uh, you can see the uh, picture of uh, Soviet troops in Vilnius. So uh, Soviet troops in Vilnius, less than in a year, Soviet troops in Vilnius was, were there and they were, uh, um, when they were starting the occupation of Lithuania. So disproved, uh, I need to disprove all those false narratives, yes. So these are the false narratives and I want to show you how these uh, false narratives can be um, explained and what really happened in Lithuania and in the Baltic states, uh, very similar uh, patterns uh, can be traced. So I have here seven steps as you can see. So of course, uh, the Soviet Union did not incorporate the Baltic states out of national security concerns. Rather, that this was made possible under the secret protocol of the Nazi-Soviet Treaty, which was written today, 83 years ago. Then the secret provision effectively gave the uh, uh, Soviet Union a free hand to conduct uh, how they call that territorial political organization of the districts making up uh, the Baltic states. This is a jargon. Uh, Soviet Union used, which resulted uh, with the forced annexation in 1940s. So uh, what was uh, the declaration about acceptance of uh, Lithuania to the Soviet Union? It was adopted in uh, uh, July, uh, 14th of July by Parla um, I, I'm sorry, in the 21st of July uh, by parliamentary, uh, by new parliament uh, elected in Lithuania, in Soviet occupied, occupied Lithuania. And those uh, false uh, or faked uh, elections uh, were, uh, took place in, um, uh, on July, uh, 14th of July. So of course, uh, those elections played a major role in Soviet attempts to legitimize the Sovietization of Lithuania since the Soviets of course insisted upon the will of the peoples. So the, bigger, the biggest ch challenge for Soviets back then was to show that this is the will of the people, yes? And we can see again now in, in Kherson and Zaporizhia in Ukraine that right now. So the will of the people of self-determination, yes? That those people who live in that territory, they want to be part of Soviet Union or Russia in, in, this, in the Ukrainian case. So parliamentary elections were one legal instru instrument which was very effectively used in, uh, in this uh, annexation pro uh, process. And then, uh, but of course we need to note that initial violations of uh, uh, those elections occurred when workers demonstrations had been organized in the capitals of Baltic states. So demonstrators were accompanied by Soviet tanks and many demonstrators were imported from Soviet Russia. So uh, we expect, of course, uh, to see that um, in, uh, I, ho I hope we won't see that in Kherson and Zaporizhia, we, but we saw that in Donetsk, Donetsk and Luhansk. Remember, and, it, and in Crimea, when they did that uh, in 2014. So this is, everything is used, all legal political instruments are used to show or to fake uh, the will of the people. So the Lithuanian puppet parliament, of course, requested uh, to be accepted to Soviet Union, but this, this was uh, completely uh, controlled by Moscow, um, uh, by Moscow uh, uh, through a Lithuanian Communist uh, Party. And of course, in August, uh, 3rd of August, the same year, Lithuania was admitted to Soviet Union. So they accepted our, our, uh, our declaration asking to join the uh, Soviet Union. But this was not over yet, yes? And um, you can see that in July uh, 23 uh, of the same year, there was uh, a very important document signed in the uh, United States prepared in the United States. This is, uh, uh, we call that Wallace uh, Declaration. And um, that was the diplomatic statement refusing to recognize uh, the annexation of, by Soviets of the Baltic states. And you can see that document right here uh, in, in the slide. This is the whole document. It's very short and precise. So 
this is very important development because you can see that uh, um, some uh, states uh, in the worldwide didn't recognize the Soviet occupation of um, uh, of the Baltic states and uh, choose to wait for the real will of the people to be expressed uh, when uh, it will be possible to say, do we want to stay in, in Soviet Union or not? Do we want to be there or not? So uh, that happened only 50 years, uh, only after 50 years in 1990s, as you all uh, know. So this is the false narrative in the Baltics. So what is the false narrative in, uh, 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 about Ukrainians' uh, sovereignty now in, uh, in Ukraine? So I, I already explained you a little in this slide, what is the false narrative transmitted and circulated in the Western audiences and even Ukrainian audience. But what we can see today, uh, uh, since last year, it's completely different level. This is something very, uh, uh, how to say, it is very um, unlikely that we will see that happening in our lifetime one, one more time. Because this is something that you are never expected to see that, a, that one sovereign co country can do to another sovereign country. So what happened, uh, what was development in uh, since uh, 2021? So of course, for a long time, pro-Kremlin outlets were questioning Ukrainian so sovereignty, but it became more visible in 2021. Um, and of course, in 2022, we saw another issue of denazification. I am not going to the to details of that denazification, but uh, what I was able to trace uh, the main, um, how to say, actions by high level, um, by high level uh, Russian officials since uh, 20, 2021, what was leading to the war, yes? So you can see here uh, Putin's uh, essay of July uh, 2021. So I can see now uh, moderator's hand. So I am now 15 minutes yeah, already. Okay, great. So uh, I am wrapping up, uh, wrapping up. So Putin's essay of July 2021, and you, and maybe some of you remember that that essay was published in English in the United States. Then Putin's speech, of course, in February, and uh, also uh, Ria Novosti editorial entitled "What Russia Should Do with Ukraine." And I must stress that this uh, ed uh, editorial was published in the week when the Bucha massacre massacre was revealed. So you see, this is something very happening at one time, uh, many uh, things. And of course, the telegram post by Dmitry Medvedev uh, of the same week, where he is telling that, um, uh, that the main uh, task of this uh, special operation is uh, to, uh, to um, change the myth, the myth, the myth of, uh, of Ukrainians. So he is simply claiming that Ukraine is not real. So this is nothing new in the long prospect, but this is already told by high officials. Yes, yeah? so this is something different. So what is happening here uh, in Zaporizhia, and this is my last slide, Zaporizhia and Kherson, you can see those two territories. They are huge, actually. I know maybe Renata, she is our Ukrainian colleague, can tell us how huge they are, what size of, of relevant of any other European country. But I know that these are huge territories and you see Crimea where new developments are happening. So what were the developments of the fake um, imitation of um, people's will of, of uh, people living there? about uh, asking to join uh, asking to join Russia so you can see that in may in, already in may her son in uh, uh, officials installed by moscow already intended uh, they claim that they will intend to ask president uh, putin for the region to join russia so this is something very similar in 1940s uh, again, uh, there is like in um, Crimean referendum, the votes in Donetsk and Luhansk were held after Russian backed militias and seized control over much of the region. And of course, uh, the first steps already were done in Zaporizhia and Kherson for replacing uh, Ukrainian uh, currency, also uh, changing uh, school curriculum. And of course, again, uh, um, erecting the statue of Lenin. 
So back to SSR, yes, back to uh, Russia. So this is what's happening at the moment. And I just hope that it is still not too late to change that because in the 1940s, nobody was really interested in the Baltic states because you know that uh, the occupation of, of the Baltic states became, uh, was uh, done the same day when Nazi entered Paris, Paris. So this is something huge in the media worldwide, but not the, uh, well, not the thing that uh, the Soviet troops entered um, uh, Baltic states. So this is my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I can just uh, uh, put the slides like this if I will need to come back to them. And uh, I, hope, I hope I managed in my time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sagatien. It was quite interesting, this comparative legal history, how it was yeah. many years ago and how it is today. And if our uh, YouTube people uh, have a question, uh, all questions will be at the end of our discussion, please. And uh, in Latvian language, we always speak about three Baltic states um, as about three sisters. But this day we have Estonian brother in our discussion and it's big pleasure uh, that um, Hannes Valikivi joined to us. Uh, he is practicing lawyer, attorney at law, but for many years he is a researcher in field of legal history. I found many publications about history 19th and 20th century. Uh, Estonian law, especially on the history uh, 19th, 20th century, including the Soviet occupation. And this today, uh, Mr. Valikivi will tell us about the fate of Estonian judges. Please, floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Sanita. I tried to set up my slides. And uh, please give me some 20 minutes. <clears throat> so, good morning. And I can't avoid starting my presentation about myself. I come from a small town in the south of Estonia called Viljandi. And I remember from my childhood, we had a family friend whose name was Moya. She was born in uh, 1924, and I remember her stories about um, her father, um, who was a lawyer. And that was probably the first um, I heard about lawyers, because uh, believe me, during the 80s, uh, we were not used to chat about legal professions. The father's name was uh, Ewald Konno, and uh, Ewald Konno's story is um, very common for the lawyers, and in fact, for um, any university graduates uh, of the time. So that's why I will spend a few minutes uh, telling you the story of Ewald Konno, Moya's father. Uh, Ewald was born in uh, Tartu in uh, 1897. His parents were the first generation town dwellers. Ewald's father, who was a carpenter, uh, died when Ewald was only two years old. And uh, mother raised him um, and uh, worked hard to afford good education to the son. Ewald's uh, three older sisters had died uh, when they were still infants, so Ewald was the only child in the family. Ewald was uh, matriculated in Tartu University in 1917. That was the year of revolution and a big mess. Uh, he couldn't study much. When the Estonian War of Independence started in November 1918, he was among the first volunteers to go to the front. But other than that fact of being a volunteer, there was nothing heroic in his war path. Um, no wounds, no career. He was demobilized as a private. After the war, um, he continued his law studies. And um, like almost every student at the time, he joined a student society. His choice was uh, Korp Sakala. And here you can see him in the middle with the only colored cap. 
Uh, he's an older man of the corporation or Corp Sakala uh, in the year 1920, um, and he's sitting among the freshmen. And um, after the graduation, he was invited to Viljandi, my hometown, by his older fellow, uh, whose name was Arthur Jung. He became, uh, Arthur Jung became his patron, and uh, Ewald started practicing law in the small town of Viljandi. Uh, he became a sworn attorney, or I call them advocates in my presentation, in 1928. Ewald Kono was a very energetic young man. He, was, he lived, um, uh, he was active in local theatre society, for instance. He was one of the founders of uh, William, the tennis and rowing club. He was a volunteer firefighter, and he belonged to the Estonian Defence League. In Estonian, uh, it's called, the organization is called uh, Kaitselit, and that was a paramilitary defense organization which was established when the War of Independence started in late 1918. He ended up as the adjutant to the uh, uh, district uh, commander of the Defense League in Viljandi. And that's not the full list of his uh, social engagements and achievements. Uh, with all these activities, Ewald Konno earned the respect of local community. He was elected uh, into the uh, town council in 1927 and several times later. And in 1936, he was elected to the National um, Estonian National Assembly. And here is the uh, campaign leaflet, leaflet of his. Uh, the assembly was uh, drafting the Estonia's second constitution in 1937. The next year, he was elected to the first chamber of Estonian parliament. Uh, he also belonged to a pro-patria union, which um, in Estonian was called Isamalit. That was a political organization which was founded after the 1934 coup d'etat in Estonia and was supposed to replace banned political parties. Now I can show you one more photo of uh, Ewald Konna. Uh, the ideal small town lawyer. Here he is sitting in his living room, and uh, here is um, seven years old Moya. The picture has been taken in uh, uh, 13, uh, 1931. Ten years later, everything had been changed. Estonia had been, every, everything had changed. Estonia had been occupied for a year almost and had been annexed to the Soviet Union. Those events um, Tovila just um, described, described us. Ewald Konno had been uh, disbarred and he was working as a manual laborer in a concrete plant in Viljandi. Early morning in, um, on Ju uh, June 14th, 1941, the doorbell of their family rang and the gunmen behind the door ordered the family to pack for travel to Russia. They were uh, deported. They were given two hours to pack the things. Two days later, Ewald Gonna was uh, separated from the wife and the child, and the daughter in Valga train station. That was the last time they saw each other. And uh, uh, only then he was told the reasons of his arrest. He was arrested. The family was just deported without any uh, decision or any legal order. And the reasons for Ewald Gono's arrests were first, his participation in the War of Independence. Well, in Soviet jargon, it was uh, called armed fight against the young Soviet state. Secondly, uh, the second count was uh, his membership in the Defense League, and the third, his membership in the Pro Patria Union. In March 1942, NKVD Special Council, or Troika, as they were called, uh, sentenced Ewald Konrad to death for the same uh, reasons. And here you can see um, the extract from the death sentence. Um, he is sentenced for active fight against the Soviet uh, power during the period of uh, civil war and for his participation in counter-revolutionary party. That's the Pro Patria Union, how it was called. And uh, Ewald Connor was executed in uh, 
in Gulag, in Severalak, in Sverdlovsk Oblast on the 20th of April, 1942. I was telling this story because it uh, was not exceptional by any means, not by the career of the young man uh, at the time, uh, and not by, the, by his fate. Dozens of Estonian uh, lawyers had similar destiny. And in fact, on the very same date, uh, on the 14th of June, uh, 1941, there were at least 37 other advocates, uh, four prosecutors and 20 judges who were all arrested uh, all over Estonia and were de uh, deported to Siberia. The accusations against the lawyers were predominantly the same. I have already mentioned the participation in the War of Independence, uh, membership in the two organizations, the Defense League, the paramilitary organization, and uh, membership in Pro Patria Union, the um, uh, political organization. Uh, often the accusations included being a supporter to veterans movement. Veterans movement was, uh, it was a popular right-wing um, uh, movement in Estonia. Actually, the reason of the coup in 1934 was because of that movement. And the participants who were uh, truly um, patriotic people, but who challenged the settled party power, they were, they were called the VAPS. And uh, being a VAPS or the supporter of the veterans, VAPS is the abbreviation in Estonian, that abbreviation was also used in the Soviet uh, investigation uh, documents. So that was another often used accusation. Uh, also, those who had participated in Russian white forces uh, during the, the civil war of Russia, not the civil war of, uh, of Estonia because there was only a war of independence. However, in Russian or Soviet narrative, it was called civil war. Um, the white Russians uh, were also caught and arrested. And um, uh, among the judges and prosecutors, uh, sometimes uh, they were just arrested because of their job, especially the higher uh, ranking judges. And uh, uh, also when they had participated in the trials against the communists, especially during the early 20s in the Republic of Estonia. So these were the accusations that the Soviet forces used. So my aim today is to um, share with you some statistics of the political repressions against lawyers in Estonia. And by political repression, to define the term, I mean uh, the commitment of crimes against humanity, such as murder, extermination, deportation, imprisonment, or breach of international humanitarian law, which includes uh, compulsory mobilization into the occupying armed forces. And um, I'm going to focus on the period during the Second World War. Here you can see the timeline of um, uh, the occupations during the war uh, 1941. Uh, it was about a one year lasting Soviet occupation, then uh, a Nazi German occupation for three years, and then back again, the Soviets. Uh, the history of Soviet and uh, Nazi repressions in Estonia has been quite widely studied. Uh, the population losses, the mechanics of uh, repressions and so forth. And there, have, there are publications. Uh, among the most uh, authoritative is the uh, report of an international committee uh, or, or international investigation commission, which was called by the chairman, uh, a Finnish diplomat, Max Jakobson, it's called the Max uh, Jakobson Commission. They have published over 2,000 pages um, of the report and supporting documents, uh, uh, research documents in uh, 2005 and 2009. Uh, I'm, I'm basing my uh, statistics on the results of the work of this commission, but also on biographies drafted are compiled and published by Thomas Anebayo and Lauri Wachtre. But I must say that the uh, fate of um, lawyers, particularly judges, prosecutors, and uh, uh, practicing lawyers or advocates has not been studied uh, thoroughly and, uh, and the conclusions haven't been published so far. So in um, 1940, in summer of 1940, we had uh, 
147 judges, uh, 24 prosecutors, and over 380 advocates or sworn attorneys. And I'm leaving aside some 20 investigating judges, notaries, and the assistance to uh, the attorneys or sworn attorneys. There were over 100 of them. And of course, there were lawyers elsewhere in civil service and, and in private practice. But I'm focusing on the three legal professions here. The repressions against the lawyers began already in July and August in 1940, immediately after uh, occupation started. And um, they culminated during the first Soviet uh, occupation on the 14th of June, 1941, as I mentioned, the mass deportation. And the same summer when there were fights between the German and Soviet forces in Estonia, there were many extrajudicial killings and also lawyers were victims of those killings sometimes. After reconquering Estonia in 1944, the arrests continued. And, uh, but luckily in a smaller scale. Here you can see the figures were, which are combining both uh, uh, the repressions carried out by Soviets during 1941, 40 to 41, and uh, immediately after the war from 1944 till say about around 50. So during the Stalin era, uh, and, and uh, as you can see, uh, 54, uh, lawyer, uh, judges were uh, repressed, 119 advocates and eight prosecutors. The, as I already mentioned, the two periods slightly differ. The casualties or, or the, the results of the first uh, repressions during the first occupation period, uh, Soviet occupation period, were much harsher, even though the um, Death sentences only started uh, in early 1942 uh, during the war uh, when the people are already in Gulag. And in 1941, the sentences were often imprisonment or even when they were life sent uh, uh, death sentences, they were often appealed and then replaced by imprisonment. But the result was exactly the same because people who were taken to uh, Siberia to Gulag, they all died despite of the punishment, or, uh, and, and many of them died even without any tribunal decisions uh, because of starvation and illnesses in Gulag, so that only one judge out of um, um, uh, th 39 or 40 judges who were deported, uh, uh, only one returned. And, and only nine lawyers returned to Estonia from Gulag, from all of those who were repressed. So the death, death toll was very, very high. The accusations, the legal accusations that were brought against uh, these people, the lawyers, uh, they were typical to the other repressions, uh, the repression, repressions against uh, uh, military officers, uh, civil servants, politicians, they uh, were based on the infamous uh, Article 58 and uh, more exactly 58, uh, Index 4 and Index 13. Uh, the first one uh, uh, met, was uh, a, a punishment for offering aid to international bourgeoisie or carrying out of hostile activities towards the USSR. And uh, 58 index 13 was, um, I think that was most often used. It was active fight against the working class and revolutionary movement. So these were the Stalin era uh, crimes and uh, punishments were up to death sentence. Uh, there, were, there are no records about the legal basis for every uh, sentence or, or every arrest. For those where there are records, uh, uh, then uh, the accusations being a member to Defence League and uh, and participation in the War of Independence and, and so forth, they mostly went under those two uh, under those two crimes. 
or, or articles of the uh, Soviet Russian criminal code. There was no, uh, of course, that was illegal because these laws were applied retroactively, even by by means of uh, or by standards of the Soviet Union. But as we know, and that has been studied a lot, um, the Soviet Union did not care about uh, uh, formal legality uh, during the Stalin period. There was no coherence, uh, different uh, trikas and tribunals, they applied uh, different sentences. Sometimes people with seemingly very little sins, even by, uh, uh, by the uh, standards of Soviet uh, uh, Soviets, uh, they were punished by death. Uh, some others uh, who had more uh, guilt, if one can say so, they, they, they were only imprisoned or some came through the repressions, even without any, or through the era, even without being repressed. But that happened very seldom. Uh, just to compare with the Nazi repressions, uh, the uh, figures are far much smaller. Uh, there were only a few Jews who were uh, Jewish advocates who were uh, uh, killed or murdered. Uh, uh, there was one prosecutor, a few judges. They were mostly Soviet collaborators. Uh, um, and and uh, most of the uh, lawyers who Say, were saved or who escaped the repressions uh, during the first Soviet occupation year, they continued work some way or another on, in the legal system during the uh, German occupation. The death toll I already mentioned is here uh, from the Soviet and Nazi German uh, repressions. Uh, these are the figures of people who died. Now, those who survived, there was an exodus from Estonia in 1944 when uh, uh, German forces were retreating from uh, the Baltics and Estonia. Uh, those who could escaped, and here are the figures of lawyers who ended up in exile. I can tell you that uh, almost none of them could work as lawyers or could con continue working as lawyers in emigration. They, they were just doing simple, often manual work with exception of few advocates or sworn attorneys who could continue their legal practice in Canada or in Sweden or in some other countries. And finally, those who stayed in Soviet Estonia without being repressed, uh, the figures, they are the smallest, uh, the, the, they often were, were ruined and, uh, and also they, among them, unless they were truly trying to co collaborate with the uh, Soviet occupants, they uh, couldn't continue their legal practice. And, and even those who tried to collaborate, there were also them, the uh, Soviet regime did not trust them. Uh, there was a big wave of uh, disbarments at the end of 40s and early 50s. So those Estonian lawyers, advocates who stayed in Estonia and uh, could practice law, they were kicked out from the bar anyway. And uh, finally, just to have a complete uh, uh, picture, these are the, the figures, the numbers of lawyers whose fate we don't know or who died in for natural causes, uh, and there are very few of them. So to, to sum up, uh, the Soviet repressions, mostly they were, they were about to cleansing the Estonian elites, because the lawyers, uh, they belonged one way or another to uh, Estonian elite, political elite. The judges and prosecutors, certainly they were high officials exercising the power, uh, judicial power. And among the advocates, there were many prominent politicians or former politicians, and uh, they were repressed uh, both because they were socially active, um, including the way of Ewald Kohn, I, I brought you as an example uh, of at the beginning of my presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hamas, for this sad and truthful story. And if you think that these numbers are not very high, you should remember that at this time in Estonia population were, was only million people. And uh, 
most uh, of uh, all uh, lawyers were punished by socialist occupation or by Nazis occupation. And it's really a sad story because uh, these are not elite, but these are intelligent people, educated people. Uh, yeah, the best part of the society, truly. And uh, yeah, population losses is, is, is a different topic and, and not for today, but you are right, uh, Estonia's loss during the first uh, year of Soviet occupation for various reasons, including the Nachum Siedlung of the Germans to Germany or... Um, yeah, uh, Baltic Germany, we lost a uh, big part of our educated society yeah. when uh, Baltic German went to Germany. Exactly. Our story, um, Latvia's story, is very similar with Estonia's story. And I researched about uh, women in uh, legal professions and some of women just uh, disappeared at the end of Second World War. Yeah. Some of the people whose uh, fate we don't know, they, they just disappeared, uh, probably for different reasons, but uh, but some of them uh, yeah, uh, probably were repressed too, we just uh, do not have records. But yeah, the population losses during the first uh, year of Soviet occupation, we lost over 100,000 people. And uh, the losses by the end of the Second World War were over 10% of the population, which is considered to be very, very high. I think Latvia and uh, Lithuania yeah. had a similar fate. Yes. Yes. So yeah, if I may just add it, uh, uh, Professor Asipo told that yes, Estonia, Latvia has similar story, but Lithuania, I myself, I was uh, investigating during my PhD thesis, I was investigating how um, the judiciary was changed, like uh, to Soviet judiciary, if you can call that judiciary. So of course, many lawyers uh, and, uh, court, uh, and judges were, um, um, they were oppressed. I mean, they were deported, they were killed, they fled. So this is our typical story. story. And this is common story. This is the pattern. This is something that is like very instrumental. You, you know what to do when you enter foreign state. Like, you know, okay, let's do the preparation, like disinformation, propaganda, neglecting sovereignty, everything there. Then let's go with the troops and then let's move all the elites who can really stand up and tell guys it's wrong. It's, it's, it's leading to occupation. It's le leading to our disappearance. So this is like, you know, handbook, how to do it. So this is, okay. thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, we shared our uh, Baltic states experience and now I have big pleasure uh, to give a floor to Renata Kazak. Uh, she is professor of legal and state history of Ukraine and foreign countries at Yaroslav Mudri National uh, Law University from Kharkiv and currently works uh, on the historical and legal aspects of sustainable development. It's a very important topic nowadays. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanita Osipova, for a presentation of mine. Uh, and thank you, Professor De Julia and Hannes, for your uh, really great outcomes. Um, it was very interesting for me to listen because I also see these comparative moments with uh, current Ukraine. Uh, so thank you for the invitation to become the part of this top issue event, uh, because it's not very common, in fact, for legal historians yeah, to have so many contemporary, um, like, points in their presentations. Um, but my today's topic, unfortunately, is uh, uh, too, too challenged, too, too contemporary, and uh, has a big perspective uh, with some historical events that all our countries had in uh, the 20th century. So I would like to share my screen um, to make a slideshow. Uh, so my topic today is the historical perspective of 2022 Ukrainian refugee crisis, uh, war and false narratives. So it covers a broad uh, and very painful topic for today. 
So today is uh, the 23rd of August, and it's not only the day of the uh, signing of a Molotov Ribbentrop, uh, Ribbentrop Pact, but it's also the uh, day of Kharkiv, like birthday of Kharkiv, uh, my home uh, city. Uh, but I had to fled uh, out of uh, it. So unfortunately, I became a subject of my today's presentation, a refugee. Uh, so that's the fact that I'm happy, very happy, and it's an honor for me to present exactly today uh, this presentation. So uh, I um, uh, that's the point of my uh, favorite quote of Winston Churchill. Yeah? Um, it's about uh, the point that I already mentioned that legal historians don't usually have a lot of um, like contemporary points in their presentations. But now I, I can uh, assume that the further back we, we can look, the further forward we are absolutely likely to see today. Uh, so I would like to provide the overall pictures of migration waves in Ukraine and tell shortly about uh, their reasons. So firstly, it's a map of Russian invasion of Ukraine. So you see the occupied territories and later I think at the discussion uh, I will answer the uh, question of Dovile uh, about the territory, about the sizes with comparison with other states. Um, and uh, But now, um, firstly, it's about the waves of migrations. There were five in Ukraine, and uh, you can see the dates. I will, um, I will take, um, I will tell a little bit more about each of it, like in a short way, just to tell about the reasons, because I think that it is this puzzle, like, you know, some sort of a puzzle. And when we uh, put it in order, in the right order, we will see all the point. That um, I think that mostly um, all these waves of migration were because of Russia. And now I will explain why. So the first wave, uh, it was 1970-1914. So it was mostly to the worst world, uh, to the US, Brazil, Canada, uh, because the American employers were uh, proactively recruiting Ukrainian laborers. And it's not a surprise that uh, you see nearly 350,000 Ukrainians made a journey across the ocean. Um, to the United States and Brazil between these years. So it was mostly labor migration. Yeah, so we cannot uh, like argue with this, but at the same time, I would like to draw your attention that um, about the changes in legal history, that in 1961, the serf domain Russian empire uh, was abolished. Unfortunately, it wasn't regulated properly. Millions of people of Ukrainians didn't know what to do next. They had a huge debt. Uh, law was uh, really unregulated for just for peasant uh, Ukrainian people. Um, so I guess that the Russian Empire started this labor migration for Ukrainians. So it was the first wave. And also Russian Empire has an impact on it. Uh, the second wave, it's more interesting, of course, for our today's discussion. So this was the era, uh, loosely speaking, defined as between two wars. Uh, it was 1990, 1939. Uh, what is interesting about the law, the legal history, is that the group of Ukrainians, um, this group of Ukrainians, was the first in modern era that would meet the contemporary refugee definition. Because um, these people faced widespread political persecution of Bolsheviks and the later Soviet regimes, and as well as the ones history most um, most disastrous artificial famines called Holodomor. Uh, it was a genocide of Ukrainian people. I am um, in uh, in foreign literature. It has the name the Great Famine in 1932 uh, 1933. Uh, so the second wave, I guess it was the beginning, what is happening now. So it was Bolsheviks, uh, later Soviet regimes, uh, um, persecution, political issues, and all, um, all of this um, uh, stuff. So, but the second wave, um, also I wanted to add to the end of the second wave, let it be like this, uh, one aspect. It is about the deportation of Crimean Tartars. I didn't want to put it in the third wave because it's, it's uh, uh, mostly uh, because of the Second World War. 
but Crimean Tatars um, deportation, so it was ordered by, by Laurent Tiberia, uh, the head of the Soviet state security and uh, secret policy, and acting on behalf of uh, Joseph Stalin. So it wasn't about war, it was just about repression. And interesting legal point, legal historical point, is that only on the 14th of November 1990, uh, 1989, the Supreme Council of Crimea declared that this deportation had been a crime. So you see how much time had passed. It was uh, the deportation of Crimean Tatars uh, was in 1944, and only in 1989 the Supreme Council um, told that it was a crime. But at the same moment, it's also an interesting aspect because, as you see, it was USSR still. So the USSR government in 1989 even the USSR state, um, they understood that it was a crime. So this is some uh, some sort of uh, picture of uh, where and uh, how they were deported, Crimean Tatars. Uh, it was in three days. Uh, so the whole nation was expelled from Crimea in three days to the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and of course, uh, Russia. So the next wave, it's the third one. Um, it is 1945-1957. I, I think that every one of you uh, heard about this and maybe have some relatives that suffered uh, because of this. So it was uh, the most distinctive and impactful wave of international migration history. Um, and also interesting point of legal history is that uh, the refugee, United Nations Refugee Convention in 1951 uh, memorialized the term refugee. Uh, partly in order to hasten the resettlements of millions of displaced persons from Second World War. The devastation of uh, this war in Ukraine uh, was estimated as 2.2 million people. They were taken from Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine to Germany as uh, laborers. Um, to, uh, five to seven million of people of Ukrainians uh, died during conflict and it was represented one third of the entire ethnic population of Ukrainians. Um, and estimated 40% of the national uh, pre-war wealth uh, was lost and 10 million of people uh, were left their home. So um, in fact, like all um, literature, they are telling that this was the most distinctive and impactful wave. Uh, but at this moment, uh, I will I will show you later in the fifth wave, um, so the current wave. Uh, this current wave is even more impactful than this third wave. Uh, I will show you in the next slides, but uh, yeah. So the next, it's, it was the fourth wave, and um, I will turn to the third wave. Uh, uh, and and the, and the second, of course, they were about uh, Russian uh, regime, Soviet regime. The fourth wave, it was the late 80s and mid 90s. It was the Ukrainian post-war situation. The economy endured um, historic collapse of, during its trans transition away from the communist economic models uh, and of Soviet era. Um, and all collateral problems, they led to uh, very huge problems. It was a 60% decline of the national GDP. And it was about half million of migrants, mostly to the US, Israel, or Germany. So you can also see that it was labor migration, yeah, economic one, but the reason was the uh, Cold War economy, uh, the post covid space, the, the Soviet era, and so on and so forth. So the last, but not the least, unfortunately, it's uh, the biggest one now, it's the fifth wave, wave and uh, Mostly uh, people say that it started in 2014, like to, to present, um, but uh, like, of, of course, because of the war, the started war on the Donbass. Uh, but I think that it is uh, just a continuation uh, now. Uh, so it's not the fifth wave that started in 2022. It is the fifth wave that started in 2014 uh, because of Russian invasion. Uh, but now it became not a wave, you see, but I, I can uh, name it as tsunami 
because more than 6 million of Ukrainians fled to other countries and more than 11 million of international uh, became an international displaced uh, internally displaced uh, people so you can see and compare with this third wave as there were 10 million and 2.2 million people were taken to Germany and uh, now it's 6 million fled to other countries and uh, more than uh, 11 million are uh, internally displaced people so uh, of course um, so th this this was the diachronic observation of the development of migration and uh, refugees in in Ukraine and uh, you can see uh, you can fully see that from these five waves of Ukrainian migration Ukrainian people became refu refugees mostly and I guess maybe only because of Russia and Soviets so the first wave it's, it was labor but because of the uh, not very um, not very successful, I, I guess, uh, policy of the Alexander II reforms and so on in the Russian Empire. The second wave, 1919, 1932, it was the repressions of Bolsheviks and Soviets. So it was fully, you see, I even uh, colored it in red. And uh, then the third one, 45, 58, uh, um, it is the Second World War. So it's not only about Russia, but uh, um, we, we all know about the Pact Molotov, Ribbentrop, and the secret protocols to it. So it's also about Russia. And uh, two last, uh, uh, I absolutely about the uh, Soviet heritage that we, we are now having. So... Uh, I would like uh, just small statistics uh, about the United Nations Refugee Agency statistics. Uh, what is the um, differences between all the those waves of migration and uh, uh, current ref refugee crisis? You can see in the age group, like in green, you see that mostly it's female than male uh, because of mobilization, because our uh, men, they uh, defend our country. And at that time uh, when it was labor or when it was uh, after the Second World War, mostly it was, uh, of course, it, it wasn't as a, um, the point of gender. And uh, both uh, male and female, women and men, uh, uh, left country uh, to search in, uh, search in peace, stability, um, and some maybe economic prosperity that Soviets uh, couldn't give them. Um, as my presentation, in fact, it's named as about the false narratives, yeah? Uh, but Dovilo already uh, mentioned plan to have it and I'm very grateful that I um now I don't need to repeat it because you know it's now it, uh, it's it's war in my country and it's little a little bit maybe um hard for me to tell about this to tell about the uh this Russian dictator speech uh, in February and so on so I would like to draw to stop attention my attention on one um Mm, false narrative that we are brothers, sisters, and so on with Russia, um, that they are trying to save Ukrainians and so on. So, of, of course, it's fake and it's false narrative because, um, of course, I understand that I'm Ukrainian. I cannot be like fully objective here, but uh, that's why I want to show you this map. And you can, uh, you can see uh, where is Kharkiv on this map. And it's 40 kilometers to Russia. And uh, here it's uh, like red, yeah. And uh, here is a uh, uh, green mark. It's 1,310 uh, kilometers. Uh, it is to Uzgorod, so to the western part of Ukraine. And uh, you can imagine that uh, 6 million of people likely go to Poland, Hungary, uh, Romania, and so on to go by train 1,310 uh, 1, kilometers uh, by this way. You see, it was uh, the crowd uh, uh, in, on the central uh, trail uh, station in Kharkiv. So, um, and uh, I was, uh, I guess, among them. And I passed uh, 30 hours uh, standing in the train, standing because people were standing there. And to, pa to pass 1,310 uh, uh, kilometers, then just sit in the car and um, to go like, for, um, 40 kilometers to Russia. So it is it is truly like objective uh, because you see the map, you see the distances and you see how people managed to go away from the people who are likely like trying to save us uh, to, to, 
to normal uh, um, place where they can be safe. Uh, so that I think I guess that that's everything that I wanted to mention for today. And um, so uh, I would like to thank you for for your attention. I would like also to thank you for the support of Ukraine uh, in these hard times. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor. Uh, at my school time, every summer we had obligate literature. I don't know, did you have, but we have. And in this summer, I had obligate literature to be more empathic. And I read many books of Erich Maria Remark because these books are about how it, to, uh, how it is to be refugee in foreign country. And uh, we could understand what happens with more empathic mind. I think if we uh, read uh, remark, we, under, we understand you better because uh, culture, music, uh, literature, uh, movies, could tell these stories, stories of each person who are involved in such terrible times and who lost their own lives, own identity in this time. Thank you very much, Professor. And the next speaker uh, will be Professor Thomas Schmitz. Uh, he is professor originally from University of Göttingen, but for a long, long time, he is DAD professor, Deutsch, Akademic, Austausch, Dienst, and uh, Professor Schmitz worked in Riga for a long time and uh, cooperated with University of Tartu in this time when he was in Riga. And uh, now Professor Schmitz is very far away in Jakarta, in Indonesia. Professor Schmitz uh, is, uh, works in fields of public law, constitutional, administrative law, comparative, uh, comparative public law, and uh, European Union law. Because all this discussion goes historical view and nowadays view and nowadays uh, restrictions for such events. Thank you. The floor is yours, Professor Schmidt. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Senator. So thank you, Dr. Professor Sagatien, for inviting me to this very interesting event. I'm talking to you from uh, Yogyakarta in Indonesia now, but I remember very well my good years in Riga at uh, uh, Latvia's uh, Universitate Juridiska Fakultate, just in the office next to Sanita. And I am worried, very much worried by this, what has happened this year. And I'm not only worried by the Russian aggression on Ukraine, but I'm also a little bit worried by the reaction in the Western countries which I think could have been a little bit more clear. I will talk today about the German reaction. Let me share my screen. I hope it works. It works, I think so. So is Germany sponsoring a war of aggression? What does the German constitution, the basic law tell about continuing on a very large scale, the import of Russian fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, even during the war. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are interested, I have uploaded uh, a, a detailed position paper on my websites in Göttingen and in uh, Yogyakarta, because there are lots of details we would need to talk about uh, if we had the time, so I could only explain them in the uh, position paper. Let's first talk about what the Russian war on Ukraine means from the legal perspective. First of all, it is a classical war of aggression. 
It's not a special military operation and not the escalation of a conflict, as we can sometimes read even in the German media. It is a clear violation of the prohibition of the use of force uh, under the UN Charter, Article 2, Number 4 of the UN Charter. That is one of the cornerstones of the modern international orders. By the way, it's also a violation of the Russian legal system itself because the universally recognized principles and norms of international law form a component part of the Russian legal system under the Russian constitution. There have been some crimes committed by Russian soldiers which are punishable under Article 8, war crimes, or 7, crimes against humanity, of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. But the aggression on Ukraine itself does not fall into the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. So there will be no uh, allegations against Putin on this basis. But if we want to understand it as a whole, we need to have a look at the bigger picture. Russia and China together revealed that in the first days of the war with joint uh, public declarations. There is a plan of Russia and China, which is not hidden, an explicit plan for a new world order that will divide the world into sphere of influences of a few hegemonic powers. In this new world order, what Russia wants to achieve, and China too, there will be no self-determination of small and medium-sized peoples anymore. They will just be the vassals of the big powers. So there will, would be no sovereignty and no self-determination of the Baltic states and the Baltic people anymore. This is a far uh, more going, far uh, reaching attack than just on Ukraine. The attack on Ukraine is just the beginning. Russia had planned and had said it explicitly to attack Moldova, Georgia, probably after that the Baltic States and Finland, and also Taiwan is in danger because uh, China is planning the same with Taiwan. What was now the German response to the Russian attack on Ukraine? As we all know, Germany is linked to the Baltic states with a long, long common history. To Ukraine, not so closely, but to the Baltic states in any case. And this attack on Ukraine is also a threat to the security of the Baltic states. There is no way that we can hide that. So the German response in general was a little bit ambivalent. There was a symbolic proclamation of a turn of the times, a Zeitenwende, by the German federal chancellor, but it has shown little consequences. It was probably just rhetoric. Germany has supported, the, of course, the, the uh, far-reaching sanctions of the European Union against Russia, but it has intervened against the plans of a complete ban of Russia from SWIFT. And only in April, after two months of war, has Germany finally abandoned officially the new gas pipeline project Nord Stream 2. And to that, it was only suspended. Germany has supported Ukraine by taking 915,000 refugees, which is remarkable, but not so much compared to that what Poland has done, and by a total of 3.34 billion euro of financial support. That is a, a lot, but not so much, because this is the sum 
of the total of financial, humanitarian, and also military commitments. All this together makes a sum of 3.3 billion euro. But Germany has shown limits of solidarity, which I did not expect. I need to tell that. There has been a reluctant and hesitant reduction of the huge imports of Russian coal, oil, and gas. Six months until a total ban of coal from Russia. Although you can buy coal everywhere in the world without problems. Five months to reduce the Russian share in oil from in consumption from 35 to 12%. 10 months to a planned total ban. And it's planned to reduce the Russian share of gas from 55 to 30% within 10 months. The outcome of this practice is that Germany has delivered a significant contribution to the financial stabilization of the aggressor, which undermines the effect of the sanctions which have been taken by the international community. Russia's fossil fuel revenue exceeds the estimated spending on the invasion because also the price has gone up. In the first two months, Germany has been the largest, but after the first 100 days, still the second largest contributor to Russia's fossil fuel revenue after China. Calculated per person in the country, Russian, Germany has contributed more to the financing of the Russian war than China. 12 point billion euro to Russia's fossil fuels revenue altogether of 93 billion euro. That's quite a lot. Germany has spent 3.5 times as much for Russian fuels than for supporting Ukraine. There has been a clear refusal to stop or largely reduce gas imports already during the war. Germany plans, or the federal government, plans to end the imports not before summer 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a look here on, on my uh, paper, which I have offered for download, I have there everywhere links. There are underlined passages. And if you click in the PDF file on these parts, there are all links with further information to the sources. There are scientific sources about these data. So that is quite a lot. The problem for me is that we should ask the question, how far must a free and democratic constitutional state in Europe go? What dimension of a crisis must it be prepared to endure to defend democracy, human rights, the rule of law, and the rule-based international order in Europe? Is this enough? Well, there are some narratives which have influenced the German response to the Russian attack on Ukraine. They are not the reason for the practice which I have presented, but additional factors which favor the reluctance to stop fossil fuel imports. One of these narratives is a distorted historical narrative of German atrocities in the Soviet Union during the World War II. It is lopsided, not denying, but neglecting the atrocities against Ukrainians and Belarusians. Often in the German understanding, the whole Slavic area of the Soviet Union is simply referred to as Russian. There's not much distinction of that. There's also the correct narrative of a deep historical guilt of Germany towards Russia because of the atrocities in the Second World War. But it leads Germans to turn a blind eye to the Russian threats on the rule of law 
and human rights and democracy in Europe. Then there are the narratives of appeasement and submissive pacifism. Submissive pacifism means if you are attack, attacked, you should subject yourself to the aggressor and uh, try to make him fall down to, so that he may be friendly with you again. Also appeasement policies, although they felt spectacularly in 1938 in the, and in the 90s in Yugoslavia, and also at the beginning of this year in the negotiations with Russia, appeasement narratives are still very strong. They are flanked by the Russian fueled narrative of the imminent danger of an atomic war. You see, Mr. Medvedev, he will talk a little bit about that in the Russian media and, and in Germany, it will be the big discussion. The worst, what I have seen was an open letter of intellectuals of 28 April, in which these intellectuals, famous intellectuals of Germany, demanded to give in to the Russian aggression with a compromise that both sides can accept. I have put a link on my uh, position paper. There you can uh, download directly the, that open lecture. A compromise that both sides can accept, even with the aggression. There are more narrators of Germany as an always true great supporter and benefactor of East European countries. Also, the narrative of Germany is the most committed, always solidary, and never selfish promoter and defender of human rights, democracy, and rule of law in the world. To a certain extent, that may be correct. My job is paid by that. As a DID guest professor, I'm paid exactly by that. However, we should not forget that Germany has never taken on any heavy sacrifice in this role. It was just financial support, political support. Germany never suffered out of solidarity to the common European values. And my question is, what will happen next if Russia moves on with its war? Then there is a narrative of a conflict between two responsible parties, Russia and Ukraine, in which Germany should remain neutral. And last, not least, but not so strong, there are, of course, the Russian propaganda narratives, which have been absorbed by the corona skeptics, the querdenker, uh, right-wing extremists, and left-wing extremists, but only by some of them. As you may know, half of the German right-wing extremists are supporting Russia, and the other half are supporting Ukraine. And there are some left-wing extremists who support Russia too. These narratives are not the reason for the German policies, but the reason for the German policies is the unwillingness to accept any supply shortages that could cause a severe economic crisis. Germany is very much afraid that there may not be enough gas and they want to avoid supply shortages for the industry and for the households for any costs, even for the costs of others. That is the main reason. However, these narrators have favored this German approach. Ladies and gentlemen, I will only talk shortly now on how I see that from the constitutionalist perspective. That's quite interesting because Germany has not violated any specific norm, neither of German national law, nor of international law, nor even the European Union sanctions. It complies with all of that. And still, personally, I think that this is unconstitutional. First of all, we may need to make clear there is no violation of the general rules of public international law as integral part of the federal German law. These general rules prohibit complicity, that means aid or assistance, 
to a war on aggression. However, the concept of complicity in international law is very narrow. And buying fossil fuels from an aggressor is not complicity. There is no general ban of trading with an aggressor under international law. So it's not illegal what Germany is doing under public international law. Because the rules on complicity are rather restricted. However, I see a violation of the principle of the rule of law, the Rechtsstaatsprinzip, which is anchored in Article 20, Section 3 of the German Basic Law, our Constitution. This is a very comprehensive concept, as Sanita will know quite well. That concept is also open, still open, for further judicial, further development of law. So this concept has mainly been developed by the jurisprudence of the Federal Constitutional Court, and it could be developed further. The first point is there is no violation of the primacy of the law, because Germany has not violated any specific rule, and also not of any other classical rule of law element. So I see, however, a violation of something new which is still uncharted terrain in constitutional law, of a duty of commitment and loyalty to the rule of law as such. So I think that Germany has violated its duty to loyalty to the rule of law here to the primacy of the rule of law in international relations by strengthening the financial resilience of a serious international law breaker. My thesis or my statement is that this duty is a part of the concept of the rule of law. But I need to admit that there is nothing in jurisprudence or in literature which I know which would clearly emphasize that. This duty, I think, obliges the state not only to refrain from illegal action, but also from action which is lawful in itself but contributes significantly to weaken the rule of law as such. Here, by strengthening a serious lawbreaker, Russia, by buying, which is a, a significant, important financial contribution to Russia, strengthening to such an extent that it enables and encourages the lawbreaker to continue. And this is what we should discuss if this is happening by the rather meager reduction of the imports of Russian gas in particular to Germany. So uh, this is still uncharted. It would need to be discussed. And of course, this duty is by nature limited to what is necessary and reasonable to exclude severe cases severe cases of a de facto general support of a serious lawbreaker. If we don't limit this duty to that, this would mean the total control of the judges on the politics. No, the politics, they have the task to concretize this duty by thorough balancing in the individual situation, taking into account the severity of the ongoing threat to the law, the possible harm of others caused by further serious breaches of law, which may be expected, for example, to uh, uh, the Baltic states of Finland, and of course, the disadvantages caused by the refraining to the refraining state here, Germany, which should refrain from importing gas in such a big Okay. So there needs to be a balancing. And only in, in radical cases could we say that there is a violation of this duty. But such duties are not totally new. We have that in the federal state as federal duty or in the European Union as a, a duty uh, to the, uh, of loyalty to the European Union. 
Well, I have in my paper listed lots of aspects which would need to be considered in the concretization of this duty. And personally, I would come to the result that there is a violation of this duty, not by stopping the import of Russian fossil fuels immediately. That would be totally unreasonable uh, to expect that from any state. But by the very sluggish and reluctant reduction over a long, long time, planned over a period of time of more than two years with the the war will still be over. In particular, the attitude to categorically refuse to take on any slightest supply shortages, not even the slightest sacred, real sacrifice to show solidarity with the often praised rule-based international legal order, which is under threat from Russia now. This I would consider a violation of this duty. But this is all still open, so you may think what is your assessment on that. By the way, I think it might also be a violation of the general commitment to human rights as a basis of every community of peace and justice in the world. Our Article 1, Section 2 of the Basic Law a binding commitment that requires to refrain from any foreign trade or economic policy that would have the side effect to facilitate serious human rights violations in or by foreign countries. This article, however, has never been activated in practice in Germany. There is no jurisprudence in fact. Last, not least, we could discuss if there is a violation of the German determination to promote world peace. Well, but this is a principle proclaimed in the preamble. So it's not constitutional law, it's just a political principle in the preamble. Anyway, I would like to ask, can it be promoting of peace to maintain a large scale trade with an aggressor of an illegal war of aggression, a trade that financially stabilizes the aggressor. So I think that there is a problem. What is the outlook? And this is what, where I see also a possible connection to the Baltic states. Will Germany be a reliable NATO partner if Russia, financially fueled by its high Fossil fuels revenues decides to attack the Baltic states next. The obligation under Article 5 NATO Treaty is unconditional, but will Germany be prepared to live up to it without any ifs and buts? If Russia, on one hand, threatens nuclear annihilation and on the other, holds out the prospect of cheap natural gas. Will the federal government resist predictable campaigns of German intellectuals to give in also to such an aggression with a compromise that both sides can accept? As these intellectuals have written in their campaign letter from April, Germany has presented itself for decades as a committed promoter of rule of law, human rights, and democracy in the world, but it has yet to prove that it is willing to make heavy and painful sacrifices to defend these values. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. It was German view on Germany from outside. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting, quite interesting. And we have some questions from our audience. I think first question is uh, to Hannes. Have you investigated why the percentage of prosecutors is so low? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for the question. Thomas J. Um, I can only give some hypothesis why it 
could have been so and give some background. I haven't investigated it, but um, indeed, uh, the when you take the proportions, then um, uh, 31 percent of the lawyers or advocates were repressed, uh, 37 percent of judges and the prosecutors were exactly in between. Uh, uh, one third of them were repressed by the Soviet uh, authorities. Uh, what could be the reasons? Well, first, uh, the prosecutor's office was liquidated among the first. When the Soviet occupation started, they deemed the prosecution and police and political police among the first institutions to take over, take control of. And the Estonian stuff was released, so the prosecutors were, so to say, in the open labor market. But... Um, uh, second, they were relatively young men. The prosecutors were prosec prosecutors' office was deemed to be sort of entry point to the judiciary, and there had been a shift of generations in late thirties. So these were relatively young men who had been uh, uh, doing their duty to Estonia and now were released. I think they could be suspicious of what what could come next, and my guess is that they went into hide, and. Uh, Two thirds were successful in uh, being uh, somewhere away, hiding themselves during the first Soviet occupation year. So that could have been the reason why uh, so many of them saved. And as we can see, they didn't stay in Estonia. Uh, most of them didn't. When the uh, German forces retreated, they all tried to escape. One of the repressed, uh, uh, the oldest prosecutor, Adalbert Luiga, he was the one who stayed in Estonia. He was arrested in 1945, and uh, he died the same year in, uh, in detention. So I think the reason to answer the question is that uh, the prosecutors, the people, they went into hides, and uh, that was the reason why they saved. Uh, the charges, maybe that's the... That, that goes with the um, with the mentality of a judge. You are a, 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 a uh, uh, an official with very limited role or very uh, strict role. Um, you probably, when you are a judge, you can't think of doing something else than, <laughs> than judging. Being a lawyer, some of them stayed in the system. About twenty percent of the judges, they were released, but probably they did not um, have the same sense of danger. And the lawyers, uh, uh, they, my guess is that they didn't feel that they are somehow targeted by the Soviets. There were a few of them who were arrested, but they were arrested during, I mean, before the uh, mass deportation in June 41. They were mostly arrested because of their some political background or activity, active, active resistance to the Soviet occupation regime. Uh, again, they didn't expect that they are going to be repressed in such a massive scale. So that's my answer to Thomas. Thank you for your answer. I think uh, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia were, um, were authoritarian states. And in Latvia, it was censorship. Censorship to publish truth what happens in Soviet state. And maybe prosecutors just have more information, hidden information from society, hidden information from attorneys of law and uh, judges, but they just uh, understand better what will happen. This censorship was a big mistake. It's from, it's very possible. Yes, they were well informed it, people, like the policemen. Because were. in Latvia, it was censorship to publish information. Uh, what happens in Soviet Union? What happened in 1937? These repressions in Latvia, nobody had the information. Thank you. And now the second question is to Dovila Sagatiene. Why do people believe false narratives? Could the reason to the vulnerable state of collectiveness and the belief that new regimes can give new, better options for better life? Well, 
<laughs> Actually, thank you so much for the question. Uh, why uh, do people believe false narratives? I, believe, I think it's uh, this question is beyond already legal history, but of course we are, as scholars, we question ourselves. What does it mean? Why we? Why some part of the society is so uh, keen or eager, you know, to believe something better in in a in a nice wrapped in a nice paper? So uh, recently, of course, I heard a lot of um, opinions on that about the false narratives and disinformation, yes, and propaganda, and this is of course the part also of a hybrid warfare, you know that which uh, started in 2014 after the Crimea annexation in in our region. The, the disinformation uh, disinformation was spread. Uh, the main reason of believing in false narratives is the lack of knowledge, the lack of knowledge and critical thinking, the lack of knowledge of what really happened. So this is actually the reason why we are here, why we are as Baltic lawyers talking here publicly in YouTube, trying to uh, spread that knowledge. But of course it's not enough. I mean, that be, that there should be like governmental uh, politics or policy, how to educate your societies, how to educate them, how to show what's really happening. And I think that's really, really very connected to the uh, Professor Osipova's uh, um, uh, remark on Latvian censorship in 1940s, that it was a mistake. So if we make here a censorship again, that would be a wrong, that would be a wrong step to do. So we need to educate and to spread the critical thinking. How to do that? Of course, there are seminars, there are um, uh, some uh, uh, scholars are sharing the ideas, but you can see that the uh, that um, this information is, um, and spreading of the disinformation is uh, like a full-time job for some people in Russia. It's full-time job. There are bot factories, trolls and everything, you know, everything is there. And I recently, I dug up some um, uh, researchers research uh, made uh, about how Russia intervened, uh, intervened the elections in the United States when the Trump was elected. And everything is there. I mean, you won't believe that research because this is all the, you know, all the scheme, how it is done using social media, mm -hmm. algorithms. So it is already digital area. It's not legal history anymore, but this is happening right now among us. And this is, uh, uh, how to say, uh, very high skilled, uh, performed in very high skilled manner. So, and this is a plan and this is a policy. There is funding for that to do. And we are doing nothing of that. I mean, we are not, of course we are, I'm not suggesting to make trolls. I'm not suggesting to, uh, uh, to, to do the same thing, but we need to counter the inf disinformation. For instance, in Lithuania, uh, there is a famous, uh, a famous uh, um, um, uh, uh, company, private company of uh, experts who are skilled in digital social media. They can trace algorithms. They can analyze them. So it's called debunk.eu. Debunk, like you know, to decipher, uh, uh, to to um, analyze what is happening on social media, what messages are delivered at social media and what people are sharing those messages and why. So this, uh, this company is actually doing a great job and trying to trace from where those messages are, are going, what, those what is the target of those messages, et cetera. But this is only one company in Lithuania doing that. So, and we don't have any specific anything in Germany, I believe, nothing yet in, 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 in Latvia or Estonia. We are, you know, we are not mobilizing and we're not giving funding for that to educate. I'm not telling to uh, disinformation, but to educate. We, because there is a tsunami of disinformation and this size of real information on social media, this size, like attractive. Yes, thank, thank you. you, Professor Sagatene. I have thought a lot about this question, and we should understand that a big part of our society grow up in Soviet Union. 
and these narratives uh, was implemented in all Soviet history. On this Soviet, but the Soviet history was nothing new. Uh, still, in the 19th century, uh, Russian Empire, when started policy of uh, Russification, they uh, wrote a false history. And Ukraine is very important part of Russian history because rec- uh, Russian history started with Kievskaya Rus. Kiev, Russia, and uh, it's reason why uh, Russian history is so long. And uh, without uh, Kiev, Russian history is more shorter since the 15th, 16th century only. Uh, And uh, this Soviet legal history, Soviet uh, history taught at schools. Uh, in Latvia, we have many Russian schools, uh, and in these Russian schools, until 19, until the beginning of uh, 21st century, was taught this old Soviet history. And this Soviet history, of course, is uh, taught in Russia. With false narratives, with keywords like fascism, Nazism, anti-Semitism, and the most uh, funny was that the Jewish people too are anti-Semites. It was the most funny. Uh, Professor Schmitz would like uh, something to add. Yeah, f- first of all, I would like to underline what you have said, and in particular, the lack of of a committed fight against disinformation and fake news. This is the big, big weakness of Western democracies. By the way, this is not only a problem in Europe or in America, for example, here in Indonesia, it's discussed in the same way. They are a little bit more aware than the Europeans already, how easily the public can be manipulated by disinformation. But I see also two other aspects now in the German narratives. One is that some people tend to believe narratives they want to believe because they are comfortable for them. For example, the narrative that the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is a two parties conflict and Germany should just be neutral. They know that it's not right, but they need the narrative to tell themselves the lie that they are good if they don't do anything. And the second aspect is what we have seen in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in in Europe, by the way, uh, in in Germany, uh, not here in Indonesia, I have only seen that in Germany, is a very high amount of people who just believe in anything, conspiracy theories, totally stupid facts. So so I I just would remind to the big anti-vaxxer uh, movement we have in Germany now, and now most of them have shifted to become a pro-Putin movement to support Putin against the bad Western. So uh, this is some mass psychological effect, which only psychologists can analyze. Uh, this is not up to us, and and you know that in in Germany there are many families friendships breaking, which have broken in the last years because of these crazy movements families, contact between children and parents, and they have not found any way to stop that. So, and this will be a challenge to the democracies in in the next years. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. We have only five minutes, but we have two questions. Uh, Professor Sagatien, can we a little bit longer work? (laughs) And answer both questions, yeah? Yes, of course, of course. Okay. okay. Uh, next question is to uh, Renata Kazak. Which wave had the largest number of Ukrainian re- refugees? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. As I have already mentioned, uh, the biggest uh, is now currently the fifth wave because it's more than six million of refugees. Of course, some people, like about two million of people, have already turned back to Ukraine because of financial things, because of lack of uh, um, job and so on. But uh, it is the biggest one now. And you see that is the point, one point, 
uh, negative ones. That the United Nation um, it doesn't have an access currently to the people, to the quantity of people on the occupied territories, like temporarily occupied by Russian. So we don't know how many people were uh, forcibly displaced to Russia. Uh, we cannot be sure in this, but uh, the numbers that are now are already the biggest, uh, so now it's already the biggest wave. And one of the points also that this Ukrainian refugee crisis is the biggest in the, uh, is the top five biggest in the world, through the whole history. So it's not only in Ukraine, but uh, top five uh, during all history all, all over the world. So yeah, that's my answer. Thank you, Professor Kazak. And the uh, last, question, last question is to Professor Schmidt. Thanks for your paper question. Does your interpretation of BL require radical change in legal interpretation acceded by German lawyers and or jurisprudence? Well, that I can answer quite clearly, no. This would be just a further development of, of law, for example, by a constitutional court decision, which would be in line with the development we had already. For example, this duty of loyalty, we know already in the federal state between the federation and the lenders, we know in the European Union. So this would not be a radical change, but it requires a quite differentiated and complicated legal thinking because this duty of loyalty, what I propose is can only serve to exclude severe cases, and it must be limited to what is necessary and reasonable, and respect the natural margin of appreciation of the political institutions, who are the first. So, so the control by the lawyer would be rather limited. So that would not be easy to implement, but it would not be a radical change. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was the last question. Uh, we could uh, wrap up, uh, Professor Sagatiene. I yeah. So uh, just a few words. I'm uh, very grateful for all the contributions, and uh, I just let me shortly come back to uh, to Renata because really we I asked in the beginning of the of the event. Uh, how big are the regions of Kherson or Kherson, Kherson, I believe, and Zaporizhia? Uh, just to imagine the scale when uh, there are some suggestions, suggestions, you know, okay, just give it to Russia and we will, you know, come back to the business as, as usual. So how much is giving like, uh, uh, and Professor Schmitz had a really good point, how much you want to sacrifice for keeping the uh, order of the, uh, rule of law, uh, which is uh, cracking, it's already cracking. So, uh, Renata, can you can you tell us just for comparison? Uh, yeah, of course, of course. I, I would I would like to to tell and compare because it's one of the points of today's presentation to widespread knowledge, uh, and for me it's important as a Ukrainian to, to for you to understand for our listeners to understand the whole scale. So Kherson Oblast and Zaporizhia Oblast uh, are together. Uh, um, it's fifty five thousand square kilometers. It's more than Estonia, like whole Estonia. Uh, and it's um, like almost the same as Latvia or Lithuania, like separately, like Latvia and Lithuania. And for instance, I have some other statistic, if, if to tell not about the Baltic states, but other states. For example, the Kherson Oblast, full Kherson Oblast, are, is bigger than Albania, uh, than Belgium, Belgium, than Macedonia and Armenia. Like, of course, separately, but all this. Uh, can, uh, and the same with the Zaporizhia Oblast. It's, it's not, uh, it's only 1,000 square kilometers uh, less uh, than Belgium, for example. Uh, and if we um, put together the areas of uh, Kherson Oblast and Zaporizhia Oblast, uh, it will be more than also Croatia, for example, such big countries. Um, yeah, so half 
half of uh, um, uh, uh, Greece and so on. So, of course, it's it's a huge scale and uh, awful disaster for Ukraine. Yeah, thank you for giving that uh, that perspective. And I especially wanted uh, to make a com remark on, on uh, the last presentation by Professor Schmitz, Schmitz because you are really wanting to find a legal background for what is happening. I mean, you really want to dig in and to see what uh, what legal uh, uh, what legal measures do we have? Instruments uh, do we have? Just you know to uh, to face uh, those changes. So, uh, what do you see the next? Just my personal question, maybe for for you and for uh, to audience also to hear. Uh, what? Do you what perspective do you see? Because you know this September is approaching, winter is coming, like you know, Game of Thrones is, is starting in full scale. So, what is your uh, prediction uh, from the perspective of Germany in the next months, in the next winter? That's my oh, question. Thank you for that question. I don't know too. I don't know. Uh, maybe the Germans need to wake up. But let me be clear, I, I observe the public discussion in Germany very closely at the moment. And in this summer, they were only talking about the threat of gas shortages in winter and that the gas price is going on. The Ukrainian war was not in their mind so much anymore. So uh, I'm not sure what, uh, what will happen. I'm a little bit worried. And uh, the... the, the um, Verfassungsschutzbehörden, the Constitutional Protection Agency, they warn that there may be rebellions even if the gas price goes up because a couple of citizens will not be willing to, uh, to accept that anymore. So we will see that, uh, but it's also the discussion in the whole of Europe which will influence that. So it will also depend a little bit on what, what is the attitude prevailing in France, or in Italy, that will have an impact too. Because the Germans are not isolated. They are also closely watching uh, what the others are doing. But I see a risk that the solidarity will, will, with Ukraine will go down when it comes to really give an own sacrifice. Because so far, Germany never needed to do so. They were only the supporters of rule of law, democracy, and uh, human rights in good weather, but not when in crisis situation. So usually I would then also, but with some delay, expect that there will be people standing up and reminding to the European common values and uh, that they will have an influence on the public opinion in Germany too. But this may come with a certain delay. delay. We will see. Thank you so much, Professor. So we are coming back to the moderator, I believe, to final remarks, yes? We cannot hear you. Thank you for everybody. It was very interesting. Uh, have, you, have we something studied from history? Remember we our common history and could understand people from outside what happened in Baltic uh, countries in 1940. Because after World War II, uh, winner didn't, uh, winner wasn't punished. And uh, yeah, and in uh, Russian speaking uh, area, these narratives from Soviet history, Soviet legal history, they are still used. And it's most terrible part. They still use these old uh, narratives about fascists, Nazis, anti-Semites, <laughs> etc. And it's very important that we share our views, we share our knowledge, we, we share our research, to make uh, peace world better. I don't know, would like uh, Mrs. Pranka something to say at the end or not? I just want to thank 
very much to all speakers for uh, these valuable contributions uh, to these very important discussions about uh, these issues. And I want to thank Professor Osipo for a very professional uh, moderate, moderator to moderate uh, today. This is really great. And thanks to all participants. Have a wonderful day today. Enjoy today that we have freedom and we can we can celebrate every day. And we can support. And we and also we, we can, can understand better what happens in Ukraine and we, we can support and we can share our uh, knowledge, our experience. Thank you for everybody. Uh, special thanks for uh, Professor Sagatine for idea and organization. Special thanks for DAD for support and for all colleagues who was ready <laughs> in this hot day and from very far away countries <laughs> take a part in our conference. Thank you and see you next time, maybe with better news from Ukraine. See you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.